Ladies and gentlemen, President of American Moment, Srab Sharma. Howdy, everyone. Thank you guys for being here today. And I hope you guys will all be accommodating as uh, you know slightly tardy registrations start to trickle in over the next few minutes. Um, and uh, thank you guys for being here today. Uh, as Will just mentioned, my name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, uh, one of the organizations helping put on this event today. Um, I suppose many of you might be wondering where the name Up From Chaos came from. And really what it came from was uh, a video I saw on Twitter, as many of us do. Uh, there's a clip of the Archbishop Fulton Sheen giving one of his legendary sermons where he says, uh, up from all this filth, up from this violence, up from this indifference of courts. And he was talking about the particular chaos at the time that he lived in um, and imploring his fellow Americans to, to rise up. And so uh, as it fell to me to sort of come up with the name for the conference, so if you don't like it, feel free to blame me, um, I thought, up from this chaos. Um, there's chaos across the world, in every region of the world, but um, we in the United States are very lucky. We're a transcontinental empire. We have oceans on either side of us, Canadians to the north and Mexicans to the south. We really are quite safe. And, um, you know, for those of us who believe that the American conservative movement has sometimes failed in conserving very much, the one thing that has endured is the fact that America remains as secure today as ever. And so conserving that security formed the, the tail end of the title. And so what... Um, what we wanted to do was put together a conference that recognizes that, that we live in this unique moment and, uh, and move forward accordingly. Uh, six years ago, I was taking a course at the University of Texas, an online course, and before the lecture, some of the professors would uh, play some of their elder Gen X music um, uh, to us Zoomer students. And one of the songs uh, that they played was called The War Was in Color. It was written by a band named Carbon Leaf. Um, in it, a father tells his son's stories about the black and white photos that his son had discovered in the attic. He says, where to begin? Let's start at the end. This black and white photo don't capture the skin. From the flash of a gun to a soldier who's done, trust me, grandson, the war was in color. Pretty heavy stuff, um, but there's a twist. The song ends as follows. Now I lay in my grave at age 21, long before you were born, before I bore a son. What good did it do? Well, hopefully for you, a world without war, a life full of color. Um, there is no son because this was a family that never started. So forgive me when I don't find it amusing when commentators like Jonah Goldberg endorse a foreign policy where, quote, every 10 years or so, the United States needs to pick up some small country, uh, throw it against the wall just to show the world we mean business, unquote. Um, more than maybe any issue, a temperate, serious class of writers, intellectuals, and subject matter experts to help assist the policy uh, makers elected by the American people to implement a sober foreign policy are needed. Uh, we don't have that, and that's what we're trying to fix at American Moment specifically. Um, we, uh, our mission is to identify, educate, and credential young Americans who will implement public policy that supports strong families, a sovereign nation, and prosperity for all. Now, that's very mission statement speak. What concretely are we doing? We're trying to build up the cadre of congressional staffers, presidential appointees, and public policy researchers that will help flesh out what an agenda that, among other things, exists to uh, support a realistic and restrained foreign policy would look like. We've existed for a little over a year, and we celebrated our one-year anniversary a few weeks ago on February 24th, and we've been blessed to have an incredible year of progress. Uh, in a very short period of time, we deployed our inaugural fellowship program where we paid young people $3,000 a month uh, to work at congressional offices or public policy organizations. We launched Foundations of American Statecraft, an intensive certification program on individual public policy issues, uh, the first of which begins next week, actually. Um, and uh, it's coincidentally on foreign policy. Uh, we've beta tested AM Fridays where we bring in interns to uh, learn from some of our favorite public policy leaders. We've produced and released 50 episodes of our flagship podcast 
podcast, Moment of Truth. Um, we've placed dozens of young staff in congressional offices and public policy organizations across DC and even across the country. Um, we've interviewed and vouched for hundreds of young professional, professionals who we will back through good times and bad. And we've hosted packed events, uh, ranging from this conference to parties to panels to dinners and even just coffees uh, with a few friends with this cohort where they can build camaraderie and envision change. Um, that is our what, but we have a why, a list of 10 priorities that motivate the work that we do at American Moment, and priority number four reads as follows. U.S. foreign policy, specifically the use of military force, must be restrained and oriented towards the national interest. Right now, at this very moment, the very same forces that led to disasters across the world are circling the wagons to reclaim issue ownership on foreign policy. They want to cement their control over the way that foreign policy is created in Washington, DC, and then promptly blunder us into another conflict that their children will not die in. Um, you would hope that the risk of the DMV area being reduced to nuclear ash would temper them, uh, even if the young men dying wouldn't. Uh, no such luck, unfortunately. Um, so we've put together this conference surrounded by many friends, allies, and mentors, and we'll discuss today how we ensure that the last seven years of progress on foreign policy, catalyzed by the revolution that President Trump brought to the Republican Party, can endure. Thank you for being here. Um, for a few logistical matters, uh, during some of our speeches and panels today, we will have time for Q&A. If you'd like to participate in Q&A, you can raise your hand and one of the gentlemen with mics will come to you, ask you what your question is, and then decide if it resembles a question enough to merit being asked. Um, we are on an extraordinarily tight timeline today. Every minute's choreographed, and so brevity would be greatly appreciated so we can fit in as many questions as possible and ensure a smooth program. Now, I'd like to invite up a friend and role model, Emil Doak, the executive director of the American Conservative. He'll be the second organization leader you'll see up here who looks a little too young for the role he holds. Um, but don't be fooled. He's exactly where he should be and where the country needs him to be. Uh, Emil has been an incredible partner for this conference, uh, and the magazine he now leads is one of the cornerstones of our worldview at American Moment. Uh, they were right from the beginning, uh, to quote a great man, and we would do well to heed them now as the American ruling class contemplates another decade of disastrous foreign policy mistakes. Please welcome Emil Doak. Thank you, Saurabh. Um, I actually have a good number of years on him, which I think is, is, speaks to how impressive Saurabh Sharma is as well. Um, well, anyways, I want to reiterate his welcome um, to all of you for, for joining us here at this SNAP conference, this partnership between the American Conservative and American Moment. Uh, we at the American Conservative have a mission to advance what we call a Main Street vision for conservatism. We're a little bit older than our partners for this conference. We were founded back in 2002 to reignite conversations that we felt conservatives had neglected since at least the end of the Cold War, if not longer. Um, our founders at that time, Scott McConnell and Pat Buchanan, chief among them, um, wanted to launch a print magazine to host these conversations and if you think back to 2002, one of those chief conversations was reconsidering America's role in the world. This was about a year after the 9-11 terror attacks, and the Bush administration was ramping up to, to launch a, a war on Iraq at that time. And we were one of the very few voices to take a conservative stand against the Bush administ administration's run-up to the Iraq war. I think back to our very first issue. Um, which you should definitely go check out. It is I, it, my, my firm belief that this issue will be a sort of stake in the ground moment for the conservative movement. But that first cover said Iraq folly on the very front. And I revisited that, that first uh, cover story in the advance of this conference. And it, it, it reads as prescient as anything that I've seen considering the last 20 years. This cover article predicted just how the invasion of Iraq could turn into a disaster. It said that the Bush administration is clearly obsessed with Iraq but it has no clear plan on what to do with this Mideast version of ex-Yugoslavia once America's military might overthrow Saddam Hussein's regime. Nor is there any understanding of how invasion and occupation will affect the Fertile Crescent, America's client Arab states, Turkey, or indeed the entire Middle East. And in the 20 years since that first cover story came out, we've remained a consistent criti critic of America's misadventures across the globe. 20 years, I think, I think it's safe to say, uh, and, and sad to say, that our predictions have come to pass, not only in Iraq, but in our many other regime change wars. 
We need to think back just to last fall with what happened in Afghanistan. The withdrawal that President Trump initiated was the right move. But if we look at how quickly Afghanistan fell back to the Taliban last fall, after 20 years of our presence there, I think it shows us how misguided that nation-building mission was. But it's also important to note that we did get out across two different administrations. And indeed, it did seem that Americans, and conservatives in particular, had learned from our many foreign policy disasters of the past 20 years. Instead of, to quote John Quincy Adams, going abroad in search of monsters to destroy, we conservatives have realized that there are issues much closer to home that need our attention. Our own border, is, our own border closer to home is in dire need of being secured. We have skyrocketing inflation that's devastating middle and working class Americans. And the social bonds of our nation are tearing at the seams as never before. So in response to that, we've seen some optimism here. We have a burgeoning new, generations, new generation of leaders on the right who are departing from the interventionist stranglehold on the party, many of whom you'll hear from here today. New conservative institutions are taking a foot in Washington that are eager to make realism and restraint a core part of their mission. You just heard from an excellent one uh, just before this. American Moment is one of those new institutions. And of course, Republican voters twice nominated the candidate who denounced the Iraq war on the GOP primary debate stage and sought to end America's endless involvement overseas. So there's a recognition on the right that after 20 years of failures, we need to turn a new page. But then came Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the old guard is back as never before. We have sitting U.S. senators openly urging the assassination of a head of state of a nuclear-armed nation. We have a myriad of other elected Republicans not only openly rejecting pathways to peace, but wanting NATO or the American military itself to shoot down Russian planes through the institution of a no-fly zone. And we are told over and over that we are not doing nearly enough quickly enough to engage ourselves in a conflict with nuclear-armed Russia. And this brushes over the immense amount of aid that we've already rightly given to Ukraine not to mention the unprecedented sanctions that we have imposed on Russia in response to their unjust war. And indeed, dissent from this rush to war is promptly condemned as unpatriotic, just as our magazine was in 2002. So there are too many similarities between what's going on today and the lead up to America's invasion of Iraq in, 2002, in 2003. But it's worth noting that the stakes are even higher. Saddam Hussein very famously did not have those weapons of mass destruction. Vladimir Putin has one of the biggest nuclear arsenals in the world. This is why I wanted to host the SNAP conference today. Now is the time for us at the American Conservative to seize on our legacy with Iraq and ensure that we don't rush into a far more costly war with nuclear-armed Russia. We will put a stake in the ground today, so to speak, that the right and the country more broadly will not go back to the days of dangerous regime change wars that are not in the national interest. So today we have gathered leading voices on the right and many of the leading voices in our politics writ large uh, to look to de-escalate the war in Ukraine. Uh, to reiterate my earlier point, we do have uh, leading um, political figures much unlike 2002. We will assess how we got here. Our first two panels will look at how Congress, the military, and the executive bureaucracy failed our foreign policy, as well as how the media and their allies escalated the conflict. And lastly, we will look towards the future. Our final panel today looks at four different conservative paths towards a realist foreign policy that puts American interests first. So we are in agreement that America's post-Cold War pursuit of endless and aimless engagement around the world was misguided. But as the last panel will suggest, we're not all in complete agreement about the specific path forward. That's a debate that we need to have, and it's a debate that we intend to host in the pages of the American Conservative. As we approach our 20th anniversary this year, we have big plans to, to seize the mantle as a flagship journal of the right. Um, keep an eye out on our website or for a, a redesign coming up in May. Um, keep an eye out also for our annual gala, our 20th anniversary gala, which will take place this fall. And I would invite all of you to join us by becoming a member of the American Conservative. You can also find that at theamericanconservative.com. I want to thank um, the staff of the American Conservative and, and American Moment. It's no easy task to throw together a major conference like this within the course of the month. Uh, they've worked tirelessly to make this happen, and I'm incredibly grateful, grateful to all of them. I also want to thank our sponsors of today's event, our presenting partner and host committee, George O'Neill Jr. and Turning Point USA, 
Our gold sponsors, Brian Hinchcliffe, Francis Najafi, Vladimir Egger, Young Americans for Liberty, and the Conservative Partnership Institute, as well as the Claremont Institute, Don Watkins, the Wallace Institute, the John Quincy Adams Society, and American Philanthropic. So anyways, thank you all for joining us here today. We have a great program in store for you, so I'm gonna leave it there and go ahead and introduce our first keynote speaker, Congressman Thomas Massey.